All right, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, as I talk, I imagine some folks will also continue to enter the uh, the talk. Uh, hopefully, everybody who signed up is able to uh, to to jump in. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all. My name is Michael Diamond. I'm the academic director for the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department here at NYU School of Professional Studies in our Division of Programs in Business. Um, and it's actually absolutely my pleasure, as it has been on several occasions this, uh, this academic year, to collaborate with George Benaroya uh, in a wonderful program that he's curated for us and for his students. Uh, as part of his uh, finance for marketing decisions class, but very much focused on uh, global decision making and 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 giving us an opportunity to invite into the class, uh, into our community, some really important and distinguished uh, global decision makers, glo global leaders, global managers, global marketers and communicators. And it's in that spirit, uh, we're delighted to welcome Michael Gonda, um, as many of you know, Michael leads as the chief communications officer for McDonald's globally, all of the work uh, that they do. Uh, I think upon his announcement, uh, it talked about ensuring uh, the company speaks uh, with a consistent voice. Um, he's working to help drive authentic content and, and connect essentially the impact of the work and, and the words of McDonald's uh, with consumers. And as Katie Fallon uh, reminded us all, uh, and for many of those who joined, you know, this is a, a larger project and initiative around building brand trust for McDonald's. And so we're really delighted absolutely to to welcome Michael and to have him share some of his, his, his thinking um, at a time, obviously, for our country and uh, for our industry at some level. That's absolutely critical to think about the relationship between words and actions and, and, and the sorts of corporate voice with which big companies can speak and, and, uh, and the, the power and influence they have to act. So delighted to welcome Michael and uh, we'll turn it over to George in his classroom. Thanks, Michael. For those of you that I don't know yet, uh, my name is George Benaroya. What I do is during the day, I work as a CFO. I started my uh, career at Procter & Gamble, then Tetra Pak, uh, Nivea, and now I work in private equity. Now, once per week, I get to do something I love, and that is to teach this class. Now, let me explain what's happening. So you have joined a real class. This is not an event. A real class going on now at NYU's School of Professional Studies. And what we do in this class is the first day, students pick a company any company they like among over 500. And they pick McDonald's. And then we learn finance by having students make business decisions. First, headcount, then pricing. With uh, McDonald's, it was super cool because we had the Big Mac data saying that it sells for $5.77 in New York City and over $7 in Switzerland, $7.29, and less than two in Russia, $1.81 in Moscow. And so we debated whether we should have a local, national, or global price list. Now, for McDonald's, it was easy, but at companies like Nike or Apple, there were different views about it. So we fostered that in class. It's not about the numbers, but it's about how do we use numbers to make you know, meaningful comments in a persuasive way. These were the price recommendations by students, and uh, there are no right or wrong numbers per se. So Grace recommended it 1%, and she explained why. Sienna, 3%, and Sush, 4%. The other thing that we do is we have students communicate to the other team, where they pretend to be customers, these price increases to see how they will react to it and so on. And here's one example from Emily. And then what we do, and this will be a spoiler for uh, students coming the next semester, is we tell them that customers are very upset about the price increases that they have implemented, and they have to decide how they will react to it. What will they do uh, not to lose those customers? The other thing we do in class is to look at a problem that companies have when there is a lot of demand and not enough inventory. 
should we prioritize all customers, stores open over a year in the case of McDonald's? Should we prioritize uh, new customers, stores we opened last week? Or should we go by hand and look up the 40,000 stores we have and prioritize, say, those close to a hospital and tell our heroes, listen, because we appreciate the work you do, we're going to uh, give you a chance to try the new uh, sandwich uh, for us. How do we do it? How do we make those decisions? So here's one record from uh, Moss, and they have 10 or 12 slides. It's just one summary. And here's a different one from uh, AB. And last week when Bob, who is the corporate VP of supply chain was with us, he did mention that that doesn't happen at McDonald's, that uh, they have a real good process to make sure that, uh, you know, that they are never sold out. But that is a whole idea, right? The third uh, step is to invite senior executives from these companies to tell us how they make these decisions in real life. As Michael said, our guest speaker today is Michael Gonda, the chief communications officer at McDonald's. And I think that you know, the three key things that he does is, as Michael Diamond mentioned, the idea of you know, how to increase brand trust, advance corporate reputation, and build organizational clarity. At a more personal level, what I think is interesting about his background is that back in 2012, Michael moved physically to Beijing, China, and he was helping while he was with uh, Weber Shandwick, global multinationals deal with crisis management. When he came back at uh, the great global maker Giovanni, he developed uh, strategies in PR, in marketing, and one of them reached 4.6 billion with a B impressions. So typically when students uh, make these recommendations, I would say, well, you know, what was the impact on sales? Giovanni is a private company, but we figured that when he was there, Michael Gonda, over four years for this billion dollar brand, sales probably doubled. So it's my real pleasure to welcome today, Michael Gonda. Well, thank you so much for that. and and. I'll just start by saying what an honor it is to have the opportunity to share a bit about personally my, maybe my journey, but also what we're doing uh, as a company. Um, I, I will say that, that um, maybe surprisingly or unsurprisingly, when you hold a communications role at a company, you're very uh, seldom getting in front of others and, and, and talking. Um, partly that's by design and partly that's out of utility. So, uh, this is probably the first time I've actually spoken, which I can say with certainty, the first time I've spoken with people outside of the company about what I do inside of the company. Uh, and, and I am you know, deeply grateful for all the insightful time that you've spent looking into what we've been doing and, and really, really eager to get into this. I, I will just say um, at the outset, I lacked all of the incredible training and education that each of you have. Uh, I went to school thinking very seriously about being a journalist um, and, and tried my hand at that for a little while. So I share that only to say that you guys are well ahead of me. Uh, and also everything I'm describing is in a way my, my plan B, my, my kind of my fallback plan. Um, and I think that you know, anything I've been able to, to do since pursuing plan B has been through a couple of very fortunate circumstances. One, having incredible mentors uh, and two, being surrounded by um, incredibly generous and hardworking people that I've been able to, to grow with and learn from uh, and work with. And that, that follows me today uh, to McDonald's. Um, I, I hold a position on the team, but I would say that I'm one of you know, 43 people on the global comms team, probably more than 200 people on the global impact team uh, that every day are focused on the same things that I am. So as I share some of our perspectives, or some of my perspectives, I do so um, hopefully on their behalf as well. So uh, with that, um, George, I'm, I'm happy to turn it back over to you and see where, where we can go, or Michael. Super, so you know, the way we do it is we have students ask the questions directly, so they'll come closer to the mic and, and they will, that's only once. 
and then we will have also the opportunity to take questions from the audience and so on and depending on how much time that we have we will get to those as well so i think the first question is from uh Emily. are we frozen or are you able to see us we see you fine we don't see emily though Okay. <laughs> yeah. Might be frozen. Yeah, we're frozen. <laughs> yeah. So it is sort of frozen then. Yeah. Yeah, that's Emily, true. Actually, actually, you might be frozen. Yeah. Just keep going, <laughs> Emily. Uh, and yeah. George, if you want to turn on and off your camera, you can. Oh, okay. There you go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Hi. What is it like managing the voice of a global brand? Do you feel the pressure of always having to be perfect? And what does it feel like when something goes wrong? Great question right out of the gate. Um, I'll take it in a, in, a, in a couple different directions. One, I would say that, the, well, first of all, it's an honor to be able to have a part in managing the voice of a brand that is as, I think, globally important and locally relevant as McDonald's. Uh, we operate in you know, upwards of 35 to 39,000 communities around the world. Uh, you know, we, we have a, obviously a very strong presence and heritage here in this country, but, but really in, in basically every region. So if you, if you start with that size and that scale, you can very quickly become, I think, intimidated and get to that point, Emily, that you're talking about, of this pressure to always be perfect, to have to scrutinize every last comma. I think that more important, particularly where we sit today and what a customer or a stakeholder is looking for is less about perfection in communication and more about humanity in communication. And I think a little bit about, you know, when I was at Chobani previously, we, we, we talked a lot about this concept of, you know, when you're small, you wanna seem big, and when you're big, you wanna seem small. Uh, and I think that that's probably true. I, I, would, I, would, I would adjust it a little bit and say that you, know, you want to you want to demonstrate your local relevance, even as you in our case have a global impact. Um, so it's less about perfection, more about humanity, and really studying the impact that you have on an individual level. Um, in terms of your, your the first, you know, the initial part of managing the voice, alignment is important. So you want to drive towards consistency for sure. You know, as a customer travels from one country to another, as a customer reads about your brand engaging in one country when they may be sitting in another, it needs to feel consistent. Uh, and, and I think that's important. But I also don't know that you can be locally relevant if you're trying to perfectly synchronize every single message because the expectation of someone in pick a country will be very different than the expectation of someone in another. And I think that that's something that you have to be acutely aware of um, when you're working with a global brand that has that importance and that community touch point like ours does. Uh, you asked about what it feels like when something goes wrong. And I, I would say you have to get pretty comfortable with that reality. Um, and particularly when you're working in a communication space, the, 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 our reality is that there's a lot that we cannot control. I don't know what's gonna happen in the McDonald's news cycle that's unplanned tomorrow. So I need to be well prepared and my team needs to be well prepared for the fact that whatever we think Friday brings, um, something very, very different may come in the door. What we can control is ensuring that our people, you know, in the corporate side of it, that's 250,000. When you capture all the employees that work within our franchise side of the business, that's more than 2 million around the world, that they have a clear sense of what we stand for, what our purpose is, what our values are, what our mission is, and what are some of the important milestones and decisions that the company's making? So I don't know what's coming tomorrow, but I know that I can control that. If I do know that something unexpected or, or undesired is coming, I can ensure that I've worked and that the team has worked hard to give people the context of what that situa situation may be um, and, and what it means for our business. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's something that when you have a large organization, you have to really think hard about the context you're providing to that entire organization. Uh, and, and Emily, I don't want to over answer this, but I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a story that took place uh, two weeks ago. There was a, a, 
a story in Fortune magazine about our company. Really good reporter, Beth Coet. I've known Beth for a long time. Uh, it was not the story that we would seek to be in the news for, but Beth did diligent reporting. She participated in a series of different interviews before she even reached out to us. And ultimately, she worked very, very, very hard, I think, to write as accurate of a story as she could possibly do within her situation. The next day, uh, there was a, a financial column that ran in Financial Times. Um, and that reporter never reached out to us. They made assertions about our business uh, and, and I think, you know, took, took too far of a leap in drawing certain conclusions about what we were doing as a company. The Fortune article has a bigger impact, I think, than, than Financial Times, but the Financial Times story really, really got to me because it was an example of journalism that could have been better. And I think that rather than the pressure to be perfect, uh, you have to put some pressure on the journalists in particular that you're working with and really ask for their diligence, their, their duty, I think, um, you know, to work with you. And I ended up writing a letter to the editor and voicing everything that I'm saying uh, to this group right now. Um, and I didn't do that with Fortune, right? You know, so it's not, it's not just about the positivity of the story. I think it's really trying to control the process that leads to those, to, to those outcomes as well. And, and not sitting there and, and only getting defensive if there's a story that you may not like or you may have not, not have wanted. So sorry, a long first answer, Emily, but, um, but I, I appreciate you asking it. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, Amy, what's going next? And um, for those of you that don't know, I have read and heard that you read the entire, or you, know, you try to read the entire New York Times every day. Is that somewhat true or is it gross exaggeration? Okay, so I think it's broadened a little bit. I'm not sure if I'm getting through all of the New York Times every day, uh -huh. um, but we'll talk about that. I think that reading the news is both a duty and a skill set. And I think it's really, really, really important. And in, in, just in society, but I think especially within this profession. Hi, Michael. Um, hey. How is building up brand trust at McDonald's different than at Chobani? Is there more of a stigma around fast food and therefore difficulties building trust with it? It's a, it's a great question. And, and I mean, I'll hook a little bit onto the big small piece that I, that I was touching on with Emily's question. But I, I would just say that, that whether you're talking about building trust or sales, um, things always get a little bit more challenging when you're working off of a larger base. Um, so the base, whether it's the reputational base, the sales base, et cetera, of a 66-year-old global company looks obviously very, very different than the base of a seven, eight, nine, ten year old um, domestic company. So everything gets a little more challenging. That needle gets harder to move. Um, uh, when you're a, a more mature company, um, just in terms of longevity, people already have their own um, perceptions of you. And I think oftentimes that's not a bad thing. You know, when I talk about a brand like McDonald's, wherever you are in the world, there's a pretty good chance that that, for many of our customers, that they've grown up with this brand, right? So they, they, they have their own experiences with it. So separate and apart from what we might be saying or doing this year, that, that experience with the brand is something that they carry with them and they form their own impressions of their, of their trust for us. So it can certainly be a strength. Uh, but I think you have to acknowledge that the needle gets a little bit more, more, more challenging. I, I would also just say that I, today, present day, the expectations of large brands are very, very different than what they may have been 20 years ago. The idea of the faceless large corporation uh, doesn't really pass the customer expectation today. Um, so, you know, I think I heard in the upfront this idea of corporate voice. I think that today for a corporation, corporate voice is almost the enemy that we all need to be guarding against. Uh, there's an expectation that you're gonna really earn the trust of an individual, that you're gonna be transparent, that you're gonna speak um, humanely uh, and that you are going to weigh in on different topics and issues that are authentic to the brand, but also important to the community. Uh, and so that's something that may not be necessarily different from a, a smaller brand um, but it's certainly more complicated when you're talking about multiple markets uh, and you know and and, and you know, 65 million customers a day that are that are engaging with you. Uh, but I'd go back to the local relevance, global impact. 
as being a through line between the small and the, and the large. Thanks, Michael. Um, this question is about trust. And the background is um, last semester we had the chief communications officer from SA Lauder. And the student, Caroline Arnos, asked for the exact same question. And the question is a company establishing trust with customers is critical. In what ways can a company enhance that trust in the digital space? It's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll just start with, with one kind of cliche answer. And that is, I think, I think, I think transparency is very important, um, particularly in the digital space. I think that um, people are coming, looking for something, hoping for something from you. And, and the reason, if you look in the US, for instance, you've got probably about three quarters of the population that are not on Twitter, right? That are not on these larger um, digital platforms that our brand is, is engaging with. So, okay, so who are the people that are there and, and what are they expecting? They're expecting an, a, either a brand experience or a brand point of view. Uh, and I think if you're not providing that with them, to them, uh, I, don't, I don't know that you're necessarily, but well, you could be losing trust, but you're certainly not gaining trust. Uh, so I, I would go back to being very, um, very intentional with how you're engaging in that space uh, and, and what you're saying. The, the only thing I, I would caution, I think we get a little bit caught up in digital as this new frontier. It's, it's not anymore. I mean, it, it, you know, for most of our customers there, it's, it's not just, you know, digitally proficient, they're digitally native. Um, but at the same time, that's not their number one experience with, with our brand, for instance. So while digital is very important, uh, so is the experience that someone has in our, in our restaurant. If you're a CPG brand, that experience that they're having with your, cust with your product is oftentimes the number one driver of preference and trust. So I would just, I would caution that, that digital is obviously critical. Um, it is important to be transparent. Uh, and yet there is still, you know, a very, a, a very critical part of the physical experience as well. Thanks, Michael. Um, my question is about headcount. So in the work that I do in finance, the number of people we hire over the last 10 years has been reduced by about half, right? Now, what is interesting about communications is that in your case, you're getting a lot more work, I would argue, right? Because in the old days, you would just issue a press release and people would read that and so on. But now you have consumers actually creating content. So my question is, is the headcount at large global companies increasing in, in communications? Do you guys are, are you guys hiring more people because you have so much more work to do? Well, I will I will plug um, our team right now and say that across the global impact team, we are in fact hiring. Uh, so, um, so, so for anyone that's that is seeking the experience of working at a, at a 66 year old company with a startup heart, uh, McDonald's is definitely a place to look at. But um, more more seriously, I I I think that it really depends, George, on 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 the company. So yes, we're growing right now. Um, and, and, and I think that that really comes from a lot of different factors, more unique to McDonald's. We just, I think we had an opportunity to invest more deeply in our communications function. Um, and that comes with the support of, of the business. Uh, and I think that there are new skill sets within communications that companies haven't necessarily had, and they're realizing are critical. And one example, I'll give within McDonald's communications function is our data intelligence or what we call performance and insights. So in the age that you're talking about with, with, um, with press releases, that was not the communications function. But today we rely heavily on insights to assess risk um, for our overall global listening um, and then to analyze the performance of our campaigns and our activities. And we're hiring people that certainly wouldn't have been the typical members of a communications team probably five or six years ago, um, if, I would, if I would dare say. So um, it's an investment. I think it, it's a testament to how important trust and brand have become to corporations. Uh, and, and I think that, that that's something that we'll see, you'll see more and more for those companies that maybe hadn't made that investment yet 
that they're going to see the need to, and 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 I think a lot of opportunities will 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 expand because of it. Super. Thanks for that. The next question is from Grace. Hi, Michael. Um, I have a question. As a chief communication officer responsible for delivering a consistent message, how much free freedom can you delegate to countries to create their own content? Yeah, I mean, a lot, right? You want freedom uh, and, and you certainly want to want to want to foster freedom and that gets back it's impossible to be locally relevant um if if you don't enable that i mean you know take toyota maybe as an example right if if toyota spent all of its time simply translating the messages that were coming out of its own headquarters i don't know that they would have the resonance within the united states where we sit that they do and, and so i i think you need to you need to create both a, an infrastructure and a, and a strategy that celebrates freedom. I also think the other side of that coin is that for a brand to have durability, for, it, for, for people to understand what to expect from it, um, it needs to stand for a few core things. You know, and, and, and you know, I, I think a lot of brands you see that do wonderful things, particularly around purpose and impact, it can sometimes, if you, if you mapped all of the issues around the world that they're standing for, it can start to look a little bit like random acts of, of distraction or random acts of, of impact or kindness even. And that is, that's the danger uh, because the, the, that lack of consistency um, creates inefficient use of resources. And I think it creates a very mixed message for, for, for your customers. So I would say you want a framework that allows for local um, adoption. And that's something that we've worked a lot on. In fact, in the last year, even here at McDonald's, right? 66 years, we're taking stock of that. And I'm I'd be happy to share a bit of that work. Um, but but you, you you want some freedom. And I think a couple of things need to be need to be core. You know, a, a brand needs to have a purpose. I don't think it can have a German purpose and a Brazilian purpose and an American purpose and a Chinese purpose. I think that ultimately you're looking for a purpose that travels. It's, it's often engaging with customers in similar ways, selling similar products. I think the same would be clear of its articulation of its mission. Um, and then certainly when you talk about global values, which is increasingly important to a number of stakeholders, that's something that really can't deviate. Um, and I'll get a little more into this, but we have four areas where we think we have the right and responsibility to drive trust and have an impact. Uh, and those four areas are global. And we, we spent a lot of time over the last year figuring that out. But how a market brings that to life is a tremendous amount of freedom. Uh, and, and I think a tremendous amount of creativity within that. But we do ask them to stay within these four pillars and I'll just share them now. One is around our, our, our commitment to our planet. Uh, the other is around our food quality. The third is around jobs, empowerment and inclusion. Uh, and the fourth is around community connection. And that gets to the fact that we have, you know, a presence in 39,000 communities around the world. So how you communicate your demonstration of that in Germany versus Brazil versus the US um, may differ and should differ. But we ask that, that your, your work around trust do, do conform to those four areas so that we can have that consistency. And that enables us to show really how we are living our purpose, how we are bringing our values to life, um, how our mission is actually having an impact in the world. Thanks, Michael. Um, Michael, Dan, do you have any questions or maybe if we can squeeze one of yours? Yeah, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, maybe building on this question around uh, corporate voice and uh, an authentic, you know, an authentic voice uh, and not, not sounding like a big corporation, linking that to the statements you were just making, Michael, about um, you know, which issues you choose. I guess my question would be, you know, uh, we even within those four uh, pillars, those four big areas you've identified where you can have impact and brand trust, you must at any given point feel pulled or drawn into a number of different issues that you could actually, you know, speak to, support, respond to, et cetera. And I just wonder if you could share with us a little bit of the calculus you know, that you go through as a, as a communications leader to, 
to think that through and you know come to a position um, that you think is comfortable for the company? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's obviously very. I think topical, just in this past year, um, and and for us, we we you know. Well, let, let me say this: for a large corporation, you're right that, that, that on any given day there's a there's something going on that will raise the question of do we need to say something? Do we need to say something? And without some sense of without a framework for how the company should be thinking about it, it can be very disorienting. Uh, and, and, you know, for us, we have been able to rely upon some of these planks that I was talking about, our purpose, our values, these four pillars, which, which um, you know, we, we shorthand within McDonald's describe as our, our leadership platform. We really rely on, on, on those to understand if it's something that connects to our values, that connects to our purpose, that connects to our leadership platform, and if we have an authentic right to speak up, um, that's something that we would we would we would do, and we have done. Um, I would say that that uh, all that being true, um, when you have a lot of employees around the world, regardless of what you're going to say externally, there's an increasing sense of attention of what you're going to say internally. Um, and, and I think that that is something that many companies are struggling with right now. Uh, and, and we've found equally some clarity in our own thinking when we go back to our values and we go back to our, our, this framework that I've, that I've been, been describing to help us understand if we're going to say something, then what would we say? Um, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, that, that's, it's, it's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as say it's worked for us, but I think it's certainly been very helpful for us. Yeah, George, I can pick up one or two others if you want that are in the Q&A. And uh, so there, there's a there's a question here, I think, about um, communicating around uh, sustainability and, and, you know, more generally a, a regenerative agriculture. Um, and, and I guess the question is framed at least, and, and you may not take this, uh, you, you know, you know, you may not take this on face value, but that, you know, uh, for a company that wasn't, let's say, traditionally, positioned as 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 healthy uh, or the food you know or the packaging being environmentally friendly what what do you think is the the journey you've been on um to to reposition the company i guess around more sustainable and uh regenerative you know, sort of circular economy so to speak yeah well i i would i would say a, probably a couple things on that especially when you zoom out look at our, our look at us as a global business and maybe not just from the lens of what producing <coughs> in one market when i joined i was astounded by the work that had been done around you know the broad theme of sustainability whether that was you know science based targets um, you know some really bold commitments uh, across our supply chain, some of which I think Bob may have even touched on. But it was very clear that McDonald's have been this kind of humble and I would even dare say quiet leader, especially within our, our sector in this space. Um, that said, I think that there is a rising tide, no pun intended, um, with with expectations that will only increase. I mean, if you look no further than the announcements coming out today on Earth Day, um, it's very clear that there is a different level, a hyper level of focus on what companies are doing. Our, our CEO, um, Chris Kamchinski, was speaking yesterday um, uh, with Senator John Kerry as part of a panel with uh, the World Wildlife Fund. And he may, I don't know, when you think of the World Wildlife Fund, you may not have thought, oh, I'm sure McDonald's will be Will be showing up there. We've actually been a you know a long-standing partner um, uh, with them. So I think Michael, if I'm if I'm kind of landing at two two points, we've been quiet. I don't know that that's to our benefit. Uh, I think there's a lot that people want to hear about that that this company's been doing because it'll have a serious impact on 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 the future. And then I think we'll we'll you know we'll look at where that am, the, the heightened ambition. Will be met with you know with even heightened action, building what I think is a you know a pretty strong, strong legacy. Excellent, George. Send it back to you, George, in the class. 
All right, thanks very much. So let's move into competition. Sienna, you want to go ahead? Hi, Michael. Um, so my question is, how does McDonald deal with competitors like Shake Shack and Chick-fil-A who are targeting young customers? Thank you. Well, it is a, a great question, so thank you for that. I'll probably dance a little bit around uh, around this one, um, but but you know try to try to speak more in the realm of 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 what I see. Uh, you know, I I think I think you know from a communication standpoint, maybe even from a I'd say a marketing standpoint, which is um, an adjacent swim lane uh, to mine. You know, I think we we equally feel a right and a need. To, to meet the needs of those customers. So I don't, I don't think we approach that from a defensive point of view of, well, are others playing there differently? You know, that, you know, again, 66 years in, into our journey, I think we, we felt like we've always been very connected to a number of different demographics, including younger customers. And that, that remains incredibly important today. Uh, and I think, I think the, the company's done an amazing job if, if I'm, if I'm, a little bit biased, forgive me. When you look at at even something that we announced this week around, you know, a famous orders program uh, with with BTS, right? I mean, it's it's just it's just it's brilliant in that it requires no you know no new complexity out of the restaurants, and it 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 speaks to a very humble truth that regardless of your of your age group or where you are in the world, um, everyone has their go to favorite order, and whether again, whether you're BTS or you're one of us, you've got your go-to McDonald's order. And I think those are things that are just very unique to McDonald's. I mean, you can't really see anyone else being able to, to, to do that and particularly not to do it in a way that feels authentic and done across 50 different countries or almost 50 different countries um, simultaneously. So uh, I feel, I think, I think the company has done some really awesome things and Again, two years in, it's been pretty cool to see, particularly how uh, we've increased, I think, our relevance within within that demographic. Super, I think there is a follow-up question from Jay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jay. Hi, how are you? Um, a quick question. Is there a way for a brand to appeal to millennials and uh, adults at the same time simultaneously? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think it, it connects um, a little bit to, to the, to the prior example too. But I would, I would say um, the prior question. I would say that I, I, I don't know that, I don't know that it's an either or, and 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 maybe even speaking less as a McDonald's executive, but just as a, as a, you know, observer and a, a practitioner in our, in our industry, I don't think that the brands that really stand out say, okay, I'm just going to stand up for or engage with a specific demographic at the expense of another. Uh, so I think the question really becomes what do different generations have in common? Uh, and, and where are ways that the brand can help, uh, or I think not even help, can stand for some of those issues. And, and for us, I look at our purpose and our values. I don't know that that is unique. So this purpose of feeding and fostering community. Community is really important to a millennial. It's obviously very important to um, older generations. Uh, and and I, so I, I think that there are some really powerful through lines throughout that. And then you activate different programs that, that really speak to that individual um, demographic in a way that is special and, and, and unique for them. And BTS is an example of probably us reaching a, a younger demographic. Um, uh, but but I, I, I think that there's a number of different initiatives that we do um, around the world that, that, that speak to, you know, to older generations as well. So um, I guess my short answer is yes, you can appeal to both. And even more so, I think you, I think you must appeal to more than just one, um, one generation. Thanks, uh, Michael. The next question is about strategy and sushi. If you want to go, and Michael Diamond, I think that we also have other questions coming about strategy. So if you want after sushi, maybe you can ask some of those questions. Sure, sure. I, uh, my question is, when McDonald's changed its growth strategy from velocity growth plan to accelerating the arches, 
any lessons learned in that process? Um, well, so for context, yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. We, we did that. We did that last year. Um, I take a deep breath because it was, it, you know, it was a, it was a tremendous undertaking. Um, obviously the strategy and the thinking that goes into it, you know, takes a tremendous amount of work and, and, and did. Um, the way that our, our CEO and others have described that strategy is um, evolutionary, not revolutionary. So a lot of the elements of the velocity growth plan, um, you know, would carry through. But I would just, I would say that unique to that moment, we were going through a pandemic. Uh, you know, we, we, had, we had gone through some different transitions within our, our own company as well. And I think if we had just communicated externally and said, okay, this is our business strategy. We, had, we ran the risk of not bringing our own people along on that journey. So for, for as much effort as we put into communicating the Accelerating the Arches strategy to our stakeholders outside of the company, we spent just as much, frankly, if not more, I'd say, communicating that to our, our what we call the three legs of the stool, um, our, our franchisees, our suppliers, and our employees. And, and I think that that was critical. And if we had used the pandemic as an excuse to not do that, it would have been a real, real misfire. Um, because you know, now, several months into 2021, uh, it's really important that people understand what the concepts of accelerating the arches entails, what that means for our day-to-day -day work um, in order to be able to deliver on the expectations of our customers and, and, and our other stakeholders. So um, that was the, you know, the big learning um, uh, for me, communicate, 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 uh, and, and don't let anything be excused to do anything less than that. I'll, I'll pick up. I'll pick up on that a uh, couple of themes in there, perhaps, George. Uh, we had some questions um, earlier on uh, the pandemic, and perhaps, Michael, uh, you could respond to how you think that sort of influenced or changed the way uh, you communicated uh, with, with any one of those three legs of the stall. You know, and, and to some extent, I think the question on all of our minds is, how much of what you learned do you think will you'll continue to apply moving forward or or was it a very unique situation so lessons learned and uh what you think you'll do differently going going forward in terms of communications well i think we've all learned how to navigate zoom and webex much more effectively so we'll take that lesson with us far into the future um but but in 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 seriousness Similarly, I think, and maybe this is an extension of the accelerating the arches um, answer, but it was very clear early on that that communications was going to be very important. Uh, and and even in the absence, perhaps, of certainty, we knew that that was going to be extremely important to increase our our um, volume of of communications to to the entire system and. You know, a lot of that was done at the market level, but the markets also needed direction from from kind of corporate, right, and from from um, the you know, from the center, uh, and 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 that you know I, I I think that that is certainly a lesson that we'll take forward when we look at some of our our um, benchmarks in terms of sentiment and, and and pulse. You know, we saw people really needing to hear what the company was doing, how it was working to keep people safe how it was working, you heard from Bob to keep to keep supply open. Um, and so communications just, I think, took a very, very, very important role and 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 played a role of a, a bit of a dot connector, um, you know, for 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 the organization. And, and from what I've heard, that's not unique to our company. I think a lot of companies saw communications playing playing in that space. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and that was very important. The other thing I'd say is credibility was important too knowing the answers that you can have as a company and the answers that you don't. Uh, knowing that for us, we quickly um, uh, partnered with the Mayo Clinic, um, as well as our markets partnered with other health institutions in their markets um, to be able to get answers to questions that they didn't have. And I think that was very important for, for customers, for crew, um, uh, for employees. And, and that was something that 
I think we would take with us going forward, uh, barring and, and, and really tapping into the expertise outside of your company to help steer um, and, and navigate forward was, was invaluable for us. Excellent. Um, one or two maybe uh, from here. Uh, it's a pretty general strategy question, I guess, uh, Michael, um, which is around what do you think some of the biggest changes uh, within the industry that you see either, you know, specific to QSRs or whatever competitive set you frame or define or or even communications like as you're looking forward now. As, as a communications leader, what do you think are some of the biggest changes or challenges that you, you face? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying that anything I share from McDonald's perspective has probably already been, been shared and, and is not my own original thinking. But um, you've heard, you know, our, our, um, our CEO certainly talk about things like digital. And when you look at our Accelerating the Arches plan, um, there, I think there's a lot you can pull out from within that because it was created, frankly, with, within the context of, of, of COVID, but also knowing that, um, that there would be some return or some exit from the pandemic and that strategy would still need to endure. Uh, and, and certainly the importance of digital engagement um, uh, pulls through on that plan. Um, uh, I think that, that customers have become acutely aware of, uh, you know, of, of, of things like cleanliness and safety. Um, and that, that is, you know, that's certainly something that, that, so when we talk, when we communicate, talking about the steps that you've done to keep people safe, to keep customers safe, I think is, you know, took a different level of importance. And you can look at anything from a Harris poll or morning consult or other bodies of research that show that rising up. And it's hard to see that not having such heightened importance in, in any kind of near term um, uh, uh, for us. So, um, so you know, strategy wise, I would, I would point back to the strategy that we've put out because I think that was again, within COVID and, and with an eye out of it. And on a comm standpoint, people uh, became very, very, very central to, to the messages that customers wanna hear, that, that frankly employees and others wanna hear um, and that, that a company must deliver. Thanks, George. You want to do some more from the class, or I'm, I've got a bunch more uh, write-ins uh, if you want uh, to keep going. So yeah, let me try to get uh, a couple fingers on most. You want to go? We got over 100 questions. So for anyone who has sent questions, uh, that, that's the background. Hi. Um, how does McDonald's adapt to new culture changes once the company has entered the market? I. I, I want to make sure I, I got that question. The audio is a little bit off on, on my side. Do you mind asking one more time? Yeah, sure. How does McDonald's adapt to new culture changes once the company has entered the new market? Mm. So it's a it's a great question. I haven't been here when we've entered a new market, right? So I I you know so I I in a personal experience, it'd be hard for me to to answer that. That said, we we are we are operating and have operated in, you know, almost 120 markets. So there are not many markets that we haven't entered into. Um, and my experience in having visited many of our markets around the world is is, I think, picking up on that word that you use, which is adapt. And I think adaptation is is critical um, in terms of a, as a market. Um, needs or expectations evolve that the company and the brand does does so with it. And I was struck when I went to visit our um, our market in, in Russia and meet with the team there. That I mean, yes, McDonald's carries with it the, this kind of iconic American brand, but at the same time, it feels in Russia like a very Russian brand. Uh, it feels in Poland like a very Polish brand. It feels in Germany like a very German brand, and 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 it feels and having lived in China. Um, you know, like elements of a very Chinese brand. So I think that, 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 that there's that balance that this, that, that this company, that this brand has struck um, that, that is not just adapting, but really integrating into and becoming, becoming part of uh, that fabric, both in the food that it serves to the communications that it, that it offers um, and its marketing. 
I would also note that, in, you know, I think a franchise business um, obviously lends itself to that, where there are owners who are locally invested in the community. That's both true when you're talking about regions or communities in the US, right? Or when you're looking around the world. And that is, I think that is part of the, the secret sauce of, of this company and how it's able to really adapt and integrate into the communities in which it operates. Super, thanks for that, Michael. So we have some questions which are more uh, personal. And I think Amy is very happy with your background. Uh, you can go ahead, Amy. Um, hi there, Michael. Um, I also have an undergrad degree in journalism or nonfiction writing. How has this skill set helped you as a chief communication officer at McDonald's? It's a great question. Um, so I touched a little bit on this as kind of plan B, but, but I'm, I'm very, I mean, I feel a very, uh, very grateful for, for, for the opportunities and, and kind of where this plan took me. I would say specifically to the skills that I learned as a kind of as a journalist in training and then in practice, I, I think that there are two things. One is, is confidence. So when you're dealing with a reporter um, that can, that, especially beginning, you're not really understanding what your roles are versus their role. There's a bit of an intimidation factor. I, I kind of having been in a newsroom, I felt like I understood what their needs were. And, and so that probably gave me a bit of a leg up there. Um, I, I also think that, you know, we work in a very multifaceted industry. So if you were to ask someone like define what the roles of communications are, you'll get a lot of different answers to that. And especially if you look at even the companies that were on your list before, what comms does may change a little bit from company to company. And I think what's important, regardless of what company you're at or what realm of communications you're in, is that everyone has a bit of their own superpower and knowing what you're really, really, really good at. Um, because you're not gonna be good at all of it. So you know, I can tell you that I mentioned the performance and intelligence team. If I were to go sit within that team, I don't think it would work out very well for the team or for me. Uh, and, and, and being really, really um, transparent about that and, and aware of that is true. But for me, as a, you know, kind of trained in nonfiction writing, I always felt like I was going to be a pretty good writer because I just spent a lot of time focused on that. Uh, and, and so that, that, that helped me a lot. Um, I, I would also just say that kind of, Amy, you, you, you know this too, like the journalists that you really respect and, and, and that you follow are good because they work really, really hard. And that was a reminder for me that if I was gonna be good at this, it was gonna come because I'm willing to work really, really hard. And that helped me early on to make sure that I was um, repellent to any ego. Uh, and and, and, and I, that's something that I, you know, I, I carry with you know, to this day. I, I try to neutralize ego when I encounter it. And I certainly have you know, tried really hard to make sure that it's not something that I possess too much of. So let me um, ask you a follow-up question. The name of the student is Michelle Warman, and she asks, if you could give yourself your best piece of advice before entering the workforce, what would that be? Man, I mean, I've gotten some really good advice. So I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky for that. I, um, I, 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 so like when, when I first started at an agency, um, uh, a mentor of mine handed me a list of like 10 things that they had, had sent um, uh, to their children and had sent it to me. And one of them was like, bring a pad and bring a pen and read every email twice. That was like, I think number one and number two. Um, and it seems so basic, but it's so like, it's so important. Um, that's specific. Holistically, I'd say before entering the workforce, do everything you can to make yourself the most interesting person that you can possibly be. Uh, I think when you're talking to people, whether it's again, a reporter, a colleague, a boss, um, uh, it's less about how good you are at, at that one thing and more about the mindset that you bring to the situation. And I think the more you invest in being an interesting person, um, uh, the more helpful it is to creating that, that well-rounded mindset. Um, and then lastly, I would say one thing I've learned we were just talking about it as a team this morning is that increasingly the pace of things have gotten 
you know, for, for any industry, just, you know, voluminous, right. And, and, and talk to anyone and it just, it's the rapidity, it's the, the, you know, the, the volume of work and how, but I think the, the most important thing that you can, that you can control in that environment is to force yourself to slow down, force yourself to really scrutinize your thinking, disconfirm whether the assumption you have is right. Um, you know, I don't kick myself on any daily basis for not being able to fix a problem, but I do kick myself if I've made kind of a simple oversight or an error. And, and that was certainly true when I first started at an agency, started in the workforce, started in, as a reporter. Um, uh, and it's definitely true, you know, today. Thanks, Michael. Um, Michael Demon, would you like to take some of your questions? Yeah, let's see if I can pick up some good things. I, I, I really appreciate your counsel, Michael, to our students there. And, uh, you know, I think it's counter, counter in a positive way to so much uh, you know, popular culture that suggests, you know, how you have to sort of crawl your way to the top and work yourself to the bone and all this sort of thing. And I think we we talk a lot more at the school about, you know, data and empathy and, you know, things being human centered and data, you know, sort of trying to get these kind of balances um, in in your life's experience and, and just generally being intellectually curious uh, about the world around you, which is obviously the privilege and education like ours affords you to some extent you know a chance to step back so so very much appreciate that um i i guess uh, i don't want to take us too far back but there was an interesting question actually from our colleague and professor mark somnale uh who had a question a little, uh, which is really sort of back into the field of uh, activism and uh you know uh speaking on social speaking out on political uh, sensitive issues etc he, he his question really is about given that very broad scale that you operate in across franchises and markets, et cetera, is, is um, you know, how do you sort of manage the level of very local activism that might crop up? You know, is, is there a way to think about, um, you, you know, uh, that, that ecosystem of activism? And, you, and you've talked obviously about how to link that to brand pillars and or, or your values or your leadership platform, but one imagines it's a much more dynamic thing than that, you know, given the number of countries, the number of franchisees, um, you know, so the question really is about, you know, how you're constantly getting a pulse of all those local activist moments or opportunities. Hmm. You know, I mean, pulse is, a, is a, I think a critical word to that. I mean, you, in our, in our industry and in our kind of in our, line of work surprises are really scary. Um, you want to you want to feel like you understand what's happening and you have good line of sight and yet at the same time that is almost impossible. So there is that tension of wanting to be able to see everything but knowing that you probably won't be able to but but and you know having as much infrastructure in place we have a great team uh, here that helps us with that within the communications team. Um, so 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 visibility is 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 essential. The one thing I would just caution is that I think words like activism and crisis often get used to describe something that may be a little bit less hysterical or less dramatic. Um, so that there are, you know, moments of tension or unexpected stories, but that is to be expected, especially for a large brand in this environment. Um, so I think what we try to do is to have some I would dare say sobriety in terms of what an issue is and, you know, whether it's got a real potential impact our brand and, and, and maybe even if it doesn't, if it's something that really requires us to, to, to say something on and, 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 and to speak up on. Uh, and, and uh, so I think having the infrastructure to know what's going on and the fortitude to be able to assess it and say, okay, this may not be, this, this may not be, you know, a, an ember that catches a forest fire um, uh, is, I think, is, is, is also very, very, very important. So maybe we can take one last personal question. Yeah, for one of the students related to that. Uh, um, so this um, question is actually on behalf of our classmate, Katrina. And she asked, being a chief communications officer is not easy. How do you ensure to consider everyone that you are trying to reach? How do you deal with the pressure? Well, you know, I think it goes a little bit to what I said in the beginning where, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here representing, you know, a, 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 an incredible team and 
none of what we do none of what we do would work without them and all of what we do would work without me so i think being very mindful of the team as much as you can is important it's only a lesson that i've learned um you know in various stages of of, of my career um so yes you got to take care of yourself but i'll put that aside for a second i think you got to really really be focused on the team and that can be that you know that that takes a lot of um it takes a lot of of attention um, and it's something that, you know, that, that I can say humbly is something that I'm really working on because I know that, again, from the McDonald's comms team in the last, in the last year alone, there's been just a number of challenges. Um, so, you know, you're dealing with the pandemic as an individual, and then you're trying to you know, deal with the pandemic as a, as a, you know, as an employee, as a, as a practitioner. Um, so I, I really try to, to emphasize that in our, in our discussions. Um, I would say personally, I've struggled always with balance. Um, and, and it's something that, you know, there's a saying, wherever you go, there you are. Um, the one thing I've tried to do, uh, you know, in, in more recently is um, I, I really do try to unplug a little bit more. I used to think that that was impossible to do. That, that was somehow a dereliction of duty. And I've come to learn that that is the only way that you can really perform, whether you're in communications or another, another realm, the human brain just doesn't work well if it's always trying to work. Uh, and so that's something that, that you know, that, that, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, it's a growth opportunity for me, um, but I, I've come to at least realize it's, it's absolutely critical. Thank you so much for that, uh, Michael. And before I pass it back on to you, uh, Michael Diamond. Uh, look, uh, Michael, I, I want to thank you so much, right? Because everything that you have said today is going to be great for the students for how they look at life and their careers and their promotions. So I think that, you know, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you very much. Well, thank you. I think you guys froze there, so I can't see you, but I'm waving back. Oh, <laughs> so. Uh, all right. Well, I think we'll, we'll take it back. Julie has one slide she'll put up, and now colleagues will join us from uh, New York. Um, Michael, uh, you know, I, I genuinely want to thank you on behalf of all of us at the school. Um, you know, while you didn't benefit from our education, we uh, hope, uh, you know, you've exhibited extraordinary uh, breadth around a lot of things we try and teach at the school. And we appreciate your sharing your counsel. The, the school has really um, set itself. It's a mission, which I think is quite ambitious, which is to create transformative learning experiences that are steeped in the real world and George's class which is really just a, a sort of a beautiful prism for that but a small part of the overall program um, it, it, you know is is a great example of what else is going on and I, I stuck up a, a slide here just if anybody who's uh, not a direct student of ours is interested in the two master's programs that we offer then you know certainly please get in touch with us via email or the website there's both the master's in marketing and a master's in PR and corporate communications. Um, but, you know, my, my real uh, point is to acknowledge just the impact that having folks like you, Michael, speak with the students in the program um, has. I think uh, many of us have that career moment where we heard someone speak or someone said something meaningful, and it really helped reframe um, how we thought about life. And, and I will uh, immediately pick up on the wherever you are, wherever you go, there you are. Um, on a very busy week, uh, you know, in, in my life and, and a very challenging week for many of us across America in terms of this constant struggle, you know, for racial justice and, and social equality and, and, and on Earth Day for, you know, climate, you know, the voice of climate science. I think we all also need to take the moments to pause and reflect and, and think of the bigger picture. So really appreciate you sharing with us um, quite candidly and openly, um, both at the sort of strategy uh, level, the professional level and the per personal level. So I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a wrap, George, um, but, but uh, Michael, many, many thanks for your time. So. Super, thanks again. Thank you all so much. It was an honor. Take care all.